Hello and welcome to OMG The Cloud, the new YouTube channel designed to step you through some basic IT related topics and get you up to speed on things that you may have had some curiosity in but uh, maybe no experience in and I want to help, uh, help you learn a few things. So our first topic is going to be about containers and you may have heard of containers, you may have some familiarity with containers already. But let's, let's take a dive into these and peel back some of the layers and see what a container really is. So first of all, what is a container? So a container is, in its essence, a self-contained siloed application or process stack. And this allows a running process to have its own operating space with its own storage, its own networking, its own runtime. And it's separate from anything else that might be running on that same system. Well, that sounds an awful lot like virtualization. Uh, however, there are quite a bit of difference uh, between the two. So we should probably talk a little bit about what the difference between a container and a VM is, a virtual machine. So a virtual machine is, in fact, a fully self-contained computer operating system completely independent from the underlying host and completely independent from any adjacent virtual machines running in the environment next to it. That is um, something a lot of you are probably already familiar with. And you might wonder, you know, is a container essentially the same thing? Maybe smaller, maybe lighter weight, maybe not as powerful. And it's really not. A container is not a virtual machine. It does not contain a hypervisor that emulates hardware. What it is, is it is it is, think of, think of a container as packaging up the running processes of a particular application and setting very specific boundaries around it, but it still runs alongside the existing other containers that could be on that same host, and, but it's also fully, it's fully encapsulated. So that makes moving a container from one host, for example, to another, almost bulletproof. You, know, you can move containers around because they do contain, not to use the word, they do contain uh, all of the things that make that process run. And that differs from a virtual machine in, in that you do not have um, an operating system that's packaged up in that. So if let's take, for example, uh, a series of five virtual machines that might be running on a, on a host, on a VMware ESX host or Hyper-V, for example, they all have similar resources. Say they have two CPUs and they have eight gigs of RAM. Well, those five virtual machines, uh, even at idle, are going to consume a fair amount of, of memory that's just required for the underlying operating system to run. They're going to, requ they're going to consume uh, an IP address. They're going to consume a fair amount of storage, even throwing out the argument of deduplication, which doesn't come into play here. So they're going to consume a fair amount at idle. Whereas um, a container, let's say you had five running containers that might have been running, let's say, the same processes that were inside those virtual machines. Those are just processes, but they're completely separated, logically separated from one another. They're not aware of one another's existence unless you plumb them together. Um, they don't interact with one another. They have very hard boundaries across one another, including at the network layer. And in storage, uh, if let's say those five containers are actually the same, say they were all just running uh, web servers, they would be very, very small because they don't have an underlying operating system. They're running on top of the host machine. Again, isn't that what a virtual machine does running on top of a host machine? Not, not in the same way. It's again, it is not a, it is not a separated operating system. It is not a uh, fully independent operating system. It's just the processes. The other thing to understand about containers is well, how how do the images themselves work? How does the how does the storage work? So if you think of a, what we would call a stateless container, it it might run a, it might start up. It might run a process. It might um, you know take some input data and then output it. It's stateless. Okay in that it's not storing anything beyond the runtime of the container, beyond the lifetime of the container. It, it is, once it's done running, it's done. But that image usually consists of multiple layers, but we'll just, we'll set the layers aside for now. But it uses the, the concept of copy on write. So when you actually write data to a container, it doesn't write to the images 
uh, it's now going to write to a separate uh, writable layer. So this is this is where it's storing and writing data. And that and in that same sense, that's why another container, maybe running on the same host, running the same image, uh, is not going to see that same data. It's going to be you know once they start up and start running, that's when they diverge uh, in their processes. So they can write data, they can write write out their cache, they can write their output files, and they don't necessarily interact with one another unless you let them. And that that write layer. Uh, is is the kind of the delta, if you would think of it that way, between when the image started, the things that it did while it's running, uh, until you then power it down. So the images themselves tend to be very lightweight, but then the the actual data that's being written and consumed is very small uh, because it's just the changes. So that's your your right layer. So something that would be really good to containerize. Let's take a good example of that. We've made a reference to some web servers. So a good one here, and this is what I have on the screen here as a good example, is MediaWiki. So this is, um, if you're unfamiliar, MediaWiki is the actual software behind uh, Wikipedia and those types of wikis that you're probably familiar with. And uh, it's, it's a, a very easily container, containerized application. Uh, this is your typical LAMP stack with a web server, uh, with an application middleware, with a database backend, and uh, you know it's got all of those those moving pieces in it. But it's pretty simple, and it's also something that's a good example because the front end of it, the actual web server, you'd probably scale that layer out. You'd want you know three or five or dozens of web front ends that are load balanced. Uh, so that you could host the traffic. That's the part that's heavier, and they might talk back to either a single or uh, you know, a single database backend, or you know potentially something that was highly available. But we could say a single one just for example. So that's something that would be really good to containerize, because those containers are going to come up. They're going to read their configuration from an external data source. They're going to write and read and write their data to an external database. When you need to upgrade them or when you just scale back the service, the containers are disposable. You shut them down and they go away. You don't have to worry about um, retaining anything in it. They're, they are stateless. That's a good example of, of something that would be easily containerized and be a good use case. Uh, something that is maybe not as good for a container and better suited to be a virtual machine? Well, there's a few things. One thing that I, I find that doesn't work too well in uh, containers is things where you need a lot of very specific network IO to it. Things where you spend an awful lot of time directly shell accessed into a service, for example, um, Home Assistant or OpenHAB, uh, these types of services where you're just doing a lot from the command line directly inside the running container. I don't find those to work too well in containers because the experience of going in and out in SSH, though you can easily open those ports, the way that it handles the copy on write data process, I find that to be problematic. So I prefer to host those types of things in a more traditional virtual machine. Um, how about things that can't be containerized? A good example would be a hypervisor itself. You're not going to try to containerize ESX server, for example, that would be kind of pointless. That's that's not how it works. I, I suppose theoretically it could be done. I don't know. But you're not going to try to do that. That is that's a machine that is either going to run on bare metal or maybe you're running nested for nested hypervisors. OK, so that's that's something like that. Now, what about networking? We talked about storage image layers and copy on write processes and how they're siloed off from one another, but they're not virtualized, you don't have that like hardware abstraction layer that you do in a VM. It's a little different, right? So how does the networking work? The most common is an overlay network. And this is where the container, the container infrastructure, so that would so that would be where Docker is going to provide a bit of an abstraction layer and talk to other hosts if you create a cluster or a swarm. So if you're using native Docker, you're going to use something called Docker Compose, and they refer to that clustering as Docker Swarm. And in that, for the networking to kind of work seamlessly across the different hosts, they do they do present an abstraction layer, and that's called an overlay network. So for those familiar with, you know, virtualized networking and running vSwitches across, um, you know, a, um, a, a VMware cluster, 
you're going to be familiar with how like distributed switches work and things like that. This is a little bit into that world, nowhere near as complex, but it just pr provides a little bit of an abstraction plane for the networking layer so that they can talk across each other, uh, across the hosts um, a little bit more seamlessly. So that's overlay networking. I'm going to actually reverse these. We're going to talk about port mapping first. So port mapping, so it's important to, to go back to the concept that these are not virtual machines. They do not have their own fully dedicated network stack. So when you bring up a, a, a container and you need to expose services, you need to expose something on the, the ports, um, you, you, have to, you have to make sure that you're not, you can't overlap ports, right? So you can't say, let's expose port 80 for this web server and then let's spin up an identical copy with port 80 exposed. No, they'll collide. There's something already running on port 80. So you do have to abide by those rules, just as if you were to install those applications traditionally alongside each other on that same host. Well, they still have to find their way out of the networking stack of that host and, and be accessible. So you have to map ports is typically how you get around that. So you would do, you know, for example, if the service itself, it's a web server, it runs on port 80, and you run, want to run, you know, three of them, you'd run them on port 8080. 8081, 8082, something like that. Okay, that's nice. That can get confusing a little later on, but it's it's how you would expose multiple services uh, on, on the single host that might have conflicting ports. Now, there's another way you can do that too, and it is a uh, networking layer called Mac VLAN. This will present what traditional Virtual, virtual infrastructure engineers would be more familiar with. This is going to give you an actual IP address, uh, an actual MAC address, thus the name MAC VLAN, and, and give you a full, a full fledged IP address dedicated to that container. And, and in turn, all of the, all of the ports, you don't have to worry about port restrictions when you're doing MAC VLAN, uh, mappings, you know, so the first thing you might think is, oh, well, I'm done listening to this. I'm just going to do everything as Mac VLAN. Bye. Uh, yeah, it's not that easy. And trust me, you're not going to want to do that. Um, it does have limitations. You cannot use Mac VLAN for, uh, for containers that are running in Docker Swarm or in Swarm mode. Uh, they, don't, they don't just easily traverse across multiple hosts in the cluster. They don't really work that way. But it is very helpful for things where you really need to steer traffic uh, in a more traditional way. So if you have not, not just something where you need to map to a port number and IP address you know, to, to steer things through a load balancer or something like that, but something where you really, really need it to be on a static IP and have you know, more, than one, more, than, more than a few ports mapped out of it, that's a good way to do it. So that's networking. Let's get a little bit more into storage. So we did talk about how containers tend to be stateless. Well, by default, they are stateless. If you were to spin up a, a container and not specify anything in the volumes section, and then you were to restart or terminate that container, you wouldn't have any output. You wouldn't have any stateful data or configuration saved from that. You, wouldn't, you don't have a virtual hard disk or, or something like that that you can just attach to another machine and spin up. It doesn't work that way. So we need, to, we need to account for that. And that's where volumes come in. So this is, this is the persistent versus stateless conversation. So again, stateless by default until you start specifying volumes. These volumes are external. And unless you destroy that external volume, uh, that, that's where the data can be written to uh, from inside your container. And there's a few different ways you can handle those. So you can create external volumes, you can create them from command line, you can create them from GUI tools like Portainer, um, and then you can uh, attach to those and, uh, and store your data there. Uh, that, that's typically what you're gonna do if you deploy an application, you've got some configuration for it. Uh, the configuration is typically gonna be written to an external uh, volume. And that's, that's a good place for it. There's other ways you can do external volumes, you can also map to um, network storage, such as an NFS share, quite handy. You can, uh, you can directly map into um, an NFS mount point, um, and that, that does work just fine across 
a uh, Docker swarm or a, a, you know, a cluster uh, as containers come up and go down and maybe get restarted and other nodes. Um, that configuration point will follow along with the container. It's part of its configuration. So it will remap that, that uh, NFS mount point over on the other side. That's a pretty good solution for the need to have persistent storage and in a clustered environment. It works pretty well. There's some pitfalls to it, um, but it works pretty well. And uh, we'll definitely be doing some examples of that a little bit later on. My closing point, I'm sick of tracking and mapping port numbers. What can be done? Okay, we touched on this earlier about port mapping considerations and 8081 and 8082. What do you, what do, you do about these things? And, and you, maybe you start deploying several containers or dozens of containers and, and then you need to connect to their, their services, their web services. And how do you keep track of all these things? Well, you can do it traditionally in the way that I just described. You can kind of keep track of those and you can, of course, you dig into the configuration to see what exactly is in there. But how do you, how do you do something in a more DNS oriented way so that you don't have to do that? Now, there's a really good solution. I'll tease this a little bit. We're going to get into this later in the series, but we're going to use a purpose-built proxy that is designed exactly for this. It's going to listen to your environment. It's going to take its configuration directly from the container's configuration files. It's going to automatically make fully qualified uh, HTTP and HTTPS endpoints for you, so you don't have to remember what port number was. And even better, you don't even have to map port numbers. You don't care. All you'd have to do is you'd take that port 80, you'd tell this proxy in its configuration file, you'd tell, you'd tell the proxy uh, what port you need exposed and what fully qualified name you'd like it to be, and it'll take care of the rest for you. And that proxy is even stateless. Don't even have to worry about configuration, at least at a baseline. There's a few things you, you could plumb into it if you wanted to, but it's fairly stateless. Uh, and that that proxy service is called Traffic. It's got a bit of a funny spelling to it. We'll dive into that a little bit later on. So anyway, this is just a brief introduction, containers, and a few of the topics we're gonna to dive into in detail. By the end of this series, you're going to have a nicely built uh, containerized cluster running a ton of applications. You're gonna have a nice web proxy in front of it so you don't have to worry about port numbers or IP addresses or any of that kind of stuff. It's all gonna be DNS driven and you're going to you're going to find the value in containers and how much lighter weight they are than virtual machines. I like to put the analogy out there that containers are to virtualization what virtualization was to physical hardware. So it's really that big of a leap forward in the way that we operate our infrastructures and I think you're going to really find the value in that. Stay tuned, there'll be another one coming soon. We're going to get into this and we're going to start building. Thanks for watching.